Thank you very much, Minister Jennifer Batiste Primus, Deputy Political Leader of the PNM, which is Joel Newell Williams, Party and Elections, Deputy Political Leader, Mr. Rohan Sinanang, other party officers, my fellow parliamentary and cabinet colleagues, members of local government, party members, supporters, fellow citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, wherever you are, viewing or listening, welcome to this public meeting of the People's National Movement at historic Pigas Corner tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of Trinidad and Tobago, Pigas Corner is very important to us in the PNM. For me, I've been in the opposition for 14 years. I spent 14 years in opposition in this country. Nine years under Patrick Manning and five years on my own. And we built up a tradition when we responded to a budget presented by a minister of finance of another country, of another party. On the day when we respond to the budget, we would come here to Pigot Corner in Belmont and talk to you, the people, about the PNM's perspectives on what has happened in the budgetary process. But we choose to come here tonight, not as opposition, but as government, to do the same thing, to respond to the budgetary process. And today, the opposition had the opportunity to respond to a budget that was prepared by the Minister of Finance. And it turned out to be a good opportunity to be at Pigas Corner. So I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and thank you all for listening. Because these are not normal times. These are very different and difficult times. And this budget that the Minister of Finance presented last Monday is probably the most difficult budget ever presented by a Minister of Finance in Trinidad and Tobago. So difficult was it that when he was finished presenting it to you, by and large, the budget has met with the approval of the wider national community. And if you didn't believe that, you only had to listen to the opposition leader today when she said she is responding to this budget with the heaviest of hearts. And I understand why her heart is heavy. Because they actually expected us to fail to stabilize the economy that they had wrecked on their way out of office in 2015. It gave them no pleasure to hear a Minister of Finance providing a way forward out of these dark situations, clear in thought with policies and programs that give us the best opportunity to overcome our difficulties. So her heart is heavy. So I sat there in amazement today and listened for three hours and 20 minutes. And after three hours, the opposition leader had not engaged any of the prescriptions in the budget of 2018. None. She spent her entire time attempting to justify the rampage that she oversaw in her five years as prime minister. But let me say something here tonight to all this entire country, man, woman, boy and girl. We're not interested in that. You dealt with that in September of 2015. And it's because you dealt with it, why today you have a PNM government addressing your problems and you have an opposition leader with a heavy heart. You see, the entire presentation of the opposition leader is about revising history 
and lying nakedly about facts that you could easily refute. When she spoke today with great aplomb, attacking me for saying that we're only going to get $2.17 billion from petroleum tax in 2017, as against 19 billion or thereabouts three or four years ago. Today, when you listen to her, here is your position leader, former prime minister, senior council self given. You think she's talking sense. The point she was making is that the prime minister was wrong at Spotlight at the Hyatt and he made a big mistake. I was talking about petroleum profit tax. I was not talking about all the revenue from the petroleum sector. I was talking about the taxation that we could get. So if you make no profit, if you report no profit, you have no tax to pay. Or if you report little profit, you report little payment. That's the issue I was dealing with. So there's a place for 2.1 billion as against some other figure covering something else. And you think she doesn't know that? She knows it, but she intends to try to fool you, the people. You think she doesn't know that they draw down $16 billion from the NGC? But she knows that if she says that today to you, when the whole country is watching the budget response and accuse the Minister of Finance of lying, you don't have the document and you can't believe that the opposition leader could lie so openly in the parliament. But even before she sat down, we sent and got the Joint Select Committee report in the Parliament signed by her own leader in the Senate, and it's all there in her own document, $16 billion over and above the budgetary allocation, and she and Larry Hawaii. And she had the unmitigated goal today in the budget presentation to innocent children to say Larry Hawaii was the best minister of finance this country ever had. He was so much of a best minister of finance that when I filed a motion in Parliament under my name and I stood up in the Parliament and I prosecuted a case against him for alleged insider trading as reported in a government document at the SEC. And he was required to come back to the Parliament and respond to the motion. What happened? Wade Mark came to the Parliament, stopped the debate, and said that the Chief Justice, the Judiciary, sent to the Parliament and said the matter sub judice, so the debate stopped. So Larry Hawaii was never made to answer to a motion in the Parliament because Wade Mark stopped the debate. And when there was an exposure on that matter and an outcry in this country, he had to come to the Parliament and apologize. He is the only speaker I know who ever had to apologize to the Parliament for lying to the Parliament. But today he is Mr. Integrity. He won't answer to this question and answer to that question and answer that question. You think they want you to forget them? Well, if you forget Kamala and her band, then you will inherit them again. You will inherit them again if you forget them. But I know you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, you would have heard her today. She used the word bankrupt six times in two minutes. You know why? Like her heart is heavy, she thought she had bankrupted the country, and Imbert is saying the country is in difficulty, but it ain't bankrupt. They set out to bankrupt this country because they don't really care. They don't care about this country. Otherwise, you know, look how much they care about this country. They have some people in this country who, whenever they write or speak, they always say they want the opposition and the government to come together in the parliament to work together. And there's too much pulling and tugging. We live in an environment of political competition for office. There's government and there's opposition. And there are times when we are required to work together. And there are times when we are in an antagonistic position in competing for office as political entities separate and apart. That is the reality. When I became the leader of the PNM, the first budget that came to the parliament under my leadership as leader of the PNM, I was a position leader. Kamala Prasad Bissasa was prime minister. I did something that Eric Williams never did, that George Chambers never did, that Patrick Manning never did. I voted for a budget bought by another party in the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago because I am about Trinidad and Tobago. 
And when PNM people came to me and said, how you could do that? We, we doesn't do that. I said, I could explain that in Balize House. And I explain it today. I voted for the budget in 2010 because they had no budget of their own. It was the PNM budget being prepared that they grabbed from the election was in May, budget coming in October. They back cut and paste it. Most of it was PNM policy. So I supported that and I explained that in Balize House. And today I could tell you the only time any opposition leader ever voted for a budget in this country, I led that in the parliament. But of course, it was the same thing with bills in the parliament. We brought, they brought bills to the parliament, 89% of what they brought to the parliament. After we put our two cents in and we worked with them, we voted in support of it. But of course, those who say they want us to work with them, we are willing to work with them. We are willing to work with them. The question is, are they willing to work for you by working with the government? The answer is a resounding no. They are all about themselves and the treasury. That's all they're concerned about, themselves and the treasury. You know, they're so concerned about crime and criminality. They see us working hard, supporting the police, and trying to get the upper hand of the criminal element. They rejoice every time they hear about a crime or a murder or any difficulty with the police. They rejoice because they see it as political opportunity for themselves. The police said to the parliament, we want some help from the parliament to keep some of those gun-toting criminals behind bars for a while to disrupt their business. We were in the opposition. We voted for the anti-gang and the bail bill with the sunset clause. We knew that these opportunities remove certain rights from people, so we don't do it permanently, but we are in a crime wave that dead back five or 10 years and it is intractable. We gotta do things differently to get the upper hand of the criminals. The police say to us that the bail bill and the anti-gang bill would help them. They're in office for five years, they had it, they use it, they abuse it. We come into office, the bill comes up for renewal. What did they do? They vote against it. Vote against it. When we came into office, we appointed a high-level committee to look at the healthcare sector, getting expert opinion from the health professionals from home and abroad. And we produce a report to the parliament on the delivery of health care in this country. We sent it to a joint select committee of the parliament just so as not to allow that to contribute to the country's well-being. They flatly refused to appoint any member to the joint select committee so it can go no further. We upgraded the plan of Vision 2020 and we created Vision 2030 with a lot of inputs from the government and others and international agencies, and we are now working towards a new plan between now and 2030. We put it in the parliament for the attention of the Joint Select Committee so that there could be a plan for Trinidad and Tobago. Once again, they will not appoint any members to the Joint Select Committee, and as a result of that, it cannot be attended to by the parliament. These are the people that you have people writing and telling you, oh, they must work with the opposition. But listen, you know, in the medieval days, there were some actions that would be called treason. Anything inimical to the interests of the state. And there were times when you'd lose your head and they hold it up to the crowd, behold the head of a traitor. We gone past that. Just understand that the opposition in Trinidad and Tobago have no interest in the well-being and the welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Just understand that. We went to the Hyatt last week, Wednesday, and gave an opportunity for the leadership of the national conversation, whether in government or in business or in labor, to come and receive the information of the country's situation. Because we know if we didn't do that, 
They will set about to mislead you. And they will set about to misrepresent. That spotlight event at the Hyatt was to ensure that the information on which you, the people, are making a decision is the proper, correct, and accurate information, whether it is good or bad. And it was a resounding success. And tonight, I want to congratulate the Minister of Finance for that and for the budget that he has brought. So I sat there today to listen to the opposition leader, who was required by her duty to report and respond to the budget of Trinidad and Tobago. You know what her report was? Her report was, and let me quote her, that the spotlight event that we had and the government's position on the country's situation, and I quote, is to create a perception in the country that the situation was worse than it really is. Unquote. That is the position of the opposition leader. So she is saying to you and to the world that what the government is saying in Trinidad and Tobago is a sham because things aren't that bad. And we're only saying that because we want you all to accept our incompetence. That is her position. Well, let me say something to you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, tonight. If you buy into that foolish, self-serving nonsense of the opposition and don't support the government in the homegrown measures to rectify your situation, and you end up in a situation where the last place is worse than it is now, you only have yourself to blame. I could tell you, if you think things are bad in Trinidad and Tobago, there's one Caribbean political leader, colleague of mine. You know what he tells me? Every morning he gets up, after he says his prayers, he talks to the head, the controller of accounts, who is the person who handles the government accounts. And he asks the question, how much money did we collect yesterday? Whether it's from customs, the courthouse, from charges, whatever. How much money we collected yesterday? And he gets yesterday's report at, at daybreak. And it's only after he gets that report he can now proceed to run the country based on what happened yesterday with the, with the revenues. That's, a, that's a, Cari a, Caricom, a Caricom country. And I suspect there's more than one of them doing that. So in Trinidad and Tobago, while our situation is very difficult, we are not anywhere near there. But we have problems at a larger scale. We have been very fortunate, but we have significantly mismanaged our affairs. Imagine... I will say to you tonight, we have taken responsibility and ownership for solving this country's problems now. The last two years, our assignment was to stabilize the situation. And difficult as you think it is now, had we not succeeded in stabilizing what they left us there, crap out the smoke your pipe right now. And let me say something to public servants too. Because you have a, all kind of leaders leading public servants these days. You better say thank God to the People's National Movement government for putting employment in front of everything else. Because we understand that when you lose a job, an opportunity is a family and maybe more than one family that is affected there. So even as we try to stabilize the difficult situation, even as we had serious difficult conditions to meet, and advice from the experts to cut some more and cut some more and fire some more. We have not done that. We have set about to reduce the expenditure. We do it in a way to minimize the drastic effects that it would have on the individuals. The government is the largest employer of labor in this country. And we could balance the budget simply by cutting public servants. We have not done that. We have gone slowly and cautiously. One, some persons will lose jobs here and there depending on what rectification we make here and there, but we have also tried to create new opportunities. But of course, they're not telling you that. As we invited them to come to the Hyatt and talk about your circumstance, Labour take the position up front. We're not coming. Not coming. So when you say to us, 
You want government and labor to work together. We can't force labor to work with the government. We would like them to work with us, but we can't force them. And if it is, you know, that they're saying that they got the invitation late, everybody else who was there got it at the same time. But then they tell you, since six weeks before the event, they told the government they wasn't going to come. So in one breath, you didn't come because you got the invitation late. But six weeks ago, you could have told the government you want no part of it. I leave that for you. You see, Minister Embert tonight spoke to you about the housing initiative that is meant to kickstart some economic activity at the base of the economy. From the lady selling street drink by the quarry entrance to the truck driver to the hardware store, we're going to kickstart the economy because the first phase was to stabilize it and now we're going to kickstart it looking for growth. The opposition understands that we might be successful. They don't want no part of that. So you know what her advice to me today is? And let me quote her advice to me today on that. Put a halt to the chairmanship of the approvals committee. So the prime minister would be chairing a committee of all the government agencies who they complain about every day as obstructing economic development in the country, whether it's tongue and country, wasa, drainage, whatever. You bring them together to ensure that their delay and their tardiness and their foolishness does not obstruct a program that is at the heart of the economic expectation. And the opposition advised me not to do it. You know why? Because they can't trust the Prime Minister to chair a committee of institutions to remove bottlenecks and lockdown. Let me say something to the people of Trinidad to be good tonight. Because you see, I was sitting next to my colleague, the Minister of Planning and Development today, and I said to her, I wonder what mark she will try and bust today because they are always trying to bust mark, right? And soon after I said that, the opposition leader went into a long discourse about the government said last year that we were going to sell a portion of shares in the power plant, the TGU plant at Union in La Brea. And she went into one long diatribe that nobody could follow what she was talking about until she got to the key point, and the point is this. A German company called Ferrostal went to see the prime minister in May I think it was May last year. And she has time, place, and date. And after that, a couple of months after that, the Minister of Finance said something, and the next thing she knows, the company is offered for sale to the company. And of course, that is a big point in the debate. And what she was implying is that there is some underhandness between the visit of Ferrostal to my office and any policy of the government to divest Ferrostal shares. Well, let me say something to Kamala Prasad Bissata tonight. The one thing that the people of Trinidad and Tobago can go to sleep on and wake up on in the morning is that I didn't come into office with my house wall falling down and to enrich myself and end up in a palace. That is the one thing you can guarantee about. And... And as I hold the office of Prime Minister, all kinds of people would want to see Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Some I see, some I don't see. But it is strange that the opposition leader could tell the world without a shred of evidence to back it up that an international company, a major German power company, came to visit the Prime Minister. And she concludes that that has something on the hand to do with corruption and government business. Canada is your style, that is not my style. That is not my style. As a matter of fact, I want to give you another assurance. Since I'm in the opposition, understanding what governance of this country is and means and who is important in this country. While I was in the opposition, I went to London a number of occasions 
I went to Houston. I went to Germany to talk to the people who operated in this country and who continue to operate here. Once I went to Germany to talk to the people in one of the major banks that fund Point Lisa's operations. And when I got there, I met with the board. You know what the chairman of the board told me when I walked into the room? He said, I'm glad you came because we were about to reconsider our position in Trinidad and Tobago. That was when Kamala and her cabinet was on a rampage in this country. But I gave them hope. I told them, hold on. An election is coming. The people of Trinidad and Tobago will intervene. They will elect a government that will have decency and integrity and work with morality in public affairs as their underpinning principle. Hold on. And the one thing you could be guaranteed about, I as your Prime Minister will never entertain any oil company executive in my hotel room in my pajamas. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I am your Prime Minister. I'm not doing that. Dust and bedroom slippers to entertain oil company executives. They spent the last year, they spent the last year looking for a mark to bust on a government minister because they're looking for company. They would like you, the people, to believe that any government in Trinidad and Tobago is like any other government. Tonight on this platform, I tell you, we of the PNM, we are a different government in Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, I give you another assurance. No contractor come into any house of mine to receive any contract. Under the last government, all those billion dollar contracts and hundreds of million dollar contracts were being divvied up in the presence of members of the cabinet. That is not happening under this government. So if you hear them saying, a certain element in this country saying they can't see ministers and they can't meet with ministers. Say thank God because it's too much a seeing and meeting with ministers the last time that cost you billions of dollars. Imagine election call for September 7th, June, July, August. That was when the government was at its busiest, borrowing money and putting it into state enterprises to divvy up and share up. And some of the contractors finish the contract before election day and get paid. Uh -huh. Yes. But right now, half of them talking to the police. Very quietly. And it would make a loud and resounding noise when they eventually end up in the public domain as to who talking to who. Because we, in this government, we are adamant that we will not we will not encourage within the ranks of the government, and the cabinet will not be a clearinghouse for corrupt actions as was the want of the last government. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, as I say to you, we take ownership of the situation. We are your leadership today, and we can only work with what's available to us today. So when the opposition leader today spent three hours Telling you about what she did, and what she did, and what she did. In those days, the average price of oil was $90 a barrel. And there was $16 billion in cash at the NGC. We don't have those available to us. So it makes a nonsense to waste my time today in the parliament spending three hours to tell me what you did in the last government. We know what you did in the last government. It is because of what you did why you are there and we are here. Because you have done those things which you ought not to have done and you did not do those things that you ought to have done and the people adjudicated on it. So let us not waste any more time about the UNC and what they did and what they didn't do. A simple thing. You know what she accuses us of today? 
hear the big point today in the budget debate that we have not appointed a commissioner of police. Now, what does that have to do with the budget? But it also has to do with Movelang. Notice I said Movelang, eh? I'm not going by the J word. But of course, it is us who want to appoint a commissioner of police. We want to abolish the existing arrangement to put a sensible arrangement in place so you don't have a commissioner of police 10 times on extension for acting stints. We have no power to appoint a commissioner of police without the process under law. They made it very clear that they will not cooperate with any change of the existing arrangement. As a result of that, since they fired Iwatsky and Gibbs, Stephen Williams has been acting consistently every six months, and sometimes I, will, I work with that man. Sometimes I feel for him. It is very unfair to put a public official in that situation. Very unfair. But I said to him, you are the commissioner of police that I have. I am chairman of National Security Council. You are my commissioner of police until somebody else is appointed and we will work together. And I can tell you, we are working together. And I can go further and tell you that we are beginning to see results. We are beginning to see results from the new approach in the police service. I, as head of National Security Council, I called in every head of each division. There are nine police divisions in this country. I called them in to, to the center in St. Anne's. And I said to them in front of the commissioner of police, speaking as chairman of the National Security Council, that every divisional head, you are responsible for the criminal activity in your district, and you must stand up and face the criminals in your district, and you will report to the country about your district and take responsibility for your district. Maybe not all of them are doing that, but some of them are doing it, and we are beginning to see results. And of course, I said to the commissioner of police in front of them, the parliament has given you the power to remove from the service corrupt police officers. Do not be afraid to do it. And I said to him, you have the power to hire specialist skills into the police service. Do not be afraid to do it. But of course, we can't rely on the opposition. You know, when I saw what was happening at the port in Port of Spain, well, of course, everybody had a lot to say about it. As prime minister, in a reshuffle of the cabinet, I brought in a new minister of works and transport. And let me say something about that minister. When we won the election, I offered that minister a senatorship. He said, no. Um, let's, let's have at least one more young person and give a young person a chance. I will, I will sit it out. Okay, so he wasn't appointed a senator. Later on, when I was about to adjust the cabinet, I went back to him because I recognized him as a man of the highest quality and the highest integrity, Deputy Leader Ron Sinana. I went back to him and I twisted his arm to come in as Minister of Works and Transport. And he agreed. And I sent him down to the port of Port of Spain with one instruction. And the instruction is to go there and find out what is going on there and clean up that place. Strange enough, the minute he begins to deal with the port, he comes under fire. Because there's a body of people in this country who talking about wanting corruption to be removed from the landscape. Not at all. If the corruption working for them, it good. Leave it just so. Don't interfere with it. If it's working for anybody else, well, they know to stand on the high horse. They know about procurement process. The first person who told us about the naked 
corrupt records at the port about the Galicia was Mr. Simon in the parliament. We didn't know that because it was hidden from us, hidden by the last government. But of course, when he did that, he stepped on corns. I have gone to join select committee in the parliament as prime minister. Never happened before in this country. A prime minister goes before a joint select committee of parliament to present information of patent wrongdoing at the port. And I said, and I'm saying again, we will hold the correct people accountable and responsible. But of course, there are those who want the minister head. Just give it the minister head and leave whoever else is there. That's not how we operate. For the first time in the history of this country, a government is in office resolutely pursuing wrongdoing to hold white collar crime by the neck and make people be accountable for their own actions. And of course, we will lose one or two friends over that. But I am sure that the vast majority of the people of Trinidad and Tobago want to see that done so that we don't end up paying billions and millions that we shouldn't be paying. But we're not surprised. We are not surprised. Another mantra that came out today in the diatribe of the opposition leader in the failed budget response is to spend a long time in her presentation with the whole country watching, trying to tell us, don't talk about what the last government did. Don't blame us for nothing. Just tell us what you're doing. I'm telling you again, we will not Stop telling you what the last government did to this country because that is one of the reasons why we are where we are today. And we want to make sure that when you have to choose a government of Trinidad and Tobago, that you choose between us and them in the right color. Don't come and pretend to us that you're somebody different because we knew. We knew what happened and you know what happened. And you knew why they put them out of office. And you know what is happening today. We have come into office now having stabilized the economy. And we're looking for growth. This budget that the Minister of Finance put out there has a number of initiatives. The main one is an initiative to get those of you who want a new place to live or a different place to live to be, use your resources because there will be more units coming. So begin to prepare yourself to take part in that process, to get your mortgage, to get a house at an, a reasonable price, and to settle your family comfortably as the economy grows in that housing program. You would have a business idea. We put a number of things in, the pla in place there for you. If you are consuming foreign exchange and you believe that you can cut back on that, do that at the personal level. If you are earning foreign exchange and you're leaving the money outside, be patriotic and bring it back home. And if you've been hoarding foreign exchange, waiting for a devaluation, don't wait no more now. Because there's a very strong lobby in this country that they want a devaluation, they want a devaluation. Fellow citizens, there are two sides to that story. One is a genuine belief that if we devalue the currency in one fell swoop, boop, at whatever level they say they value it to, we'll get more TT dollars or some TT dollars, and that will solve our problem. But that argument has another side, which the government must be looking at. And the other side is this. When you devalue the currency, there's a knock-on into increased costs and increase inflation, and who are the ones who face that the most and the worst? The poorest of the poor. So while you get this advice coming from certain quarters that the problems can be solved by devaluation, that's an option which this government has not chosen to apl apply. We have chosen to allow pressures on the dollar to slowly or imperceptibly push the levels up so you can have time to adjust if you are seeing it affecting you in certain particular ways. But there's another side to it too. There are people who have been hoarding foreign currency in this country waiting for a devaluation. 
and their advice, the only advice they could give the government is to devalue the currency. Because they stand to benefit personally for a little while. Well, I'm saying this. If such persons benefit by a drastic devaluation, it has to be at the expense of the wider national community. And on that basis, the government has not chosen that option. And we are expecting that the measures we are putting in place, if the currency moves imperceptibly within a certain band of reason, we could live with that. What we are not going to do is to be in this situation where we have lost a significant amount of the foreign inflows because of what has happened in the energy sector. But we still want to import motor cars like motor cars going out of style. Some countries, when Jamaica was in a difficult situation like this, they had banned the importation of new cars totally. In Barbados, the tax on a new car is such as to discourage its purchase. We have not gone that far. We are simply saying we are giving you choices to decide what role you want to play in the business. We have increased the tax on high-end vehicles. If you figure you must have a high-end vehicle and you must pay, and, and, and you, 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 you have the, the, the means to buy it, okay, nobody's saying don't buy it. But we are saying if you want to take our foreign exchange and buy it, there's a penalty for that. There's a choice. If you want to do something that involves an additional tax, there may be an option to not do it. Let me come to the point about this food import bill. And you're all saying about agriculture and agriculture and agriculture. It's a cliche in this country. 99% of those in this country who talk about agriculture don't want nothing to do with agriculture. They don't even want to dirty their hand in their own yard. But of course, those who are in agriculture producing, they are always struggling because you could have as much agriculture as you want if the country's consumption pattern is for foreign foods and foreign items, you could have as much growth as you want in this country. They're not using the local produce. The last time I spoke about cassava on a public platform here, they talked about it for a whole week. But every fancy packaged stuff, the more salt, the more fat, to come and harass the hospital after. And now we don't have the foreign exchange. And we are saying to you at the personal level, you have a choice. We have to find savings. Even after we remove the, 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 the subsidy on, on gasoline, we are still in line to pay $700 million in subsidy on diesel. Subsidy. You know what a subsidy is? It means that there was a price that you had to pay all along. But somewhere along the way, when we had the means... The government came in and paid part of the cost for you. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not now have the means to do that. So isn't it obvious that a subsidy which you were carrying when you had the means, now that you have seen the details of our circumstance, try and see if you could come up with one idea to reduce your own personal fuel consumption bill. Come up with one idea. You might be able to, you know, one idea. Since I was a student in England in, 19, in the mid-70s, if one of our colleagues had a car and we had to go anywhere, the one thing that came up for discussion and settled before the car moved off is the cost of the petrol that is shared by everybody in the car. Everybody in the car had to contribute to the cost of the trip. The one thing that never comes up in Trinidad and Tobago when a trip is considered, whether the trip is required or is totally unnecessary, the one thing that never comes up is the cost of the fuel. You know why? Because in Trinidad and Tobago, we still have the cheapest fuel in the CARICOM and among the cheapest in the world. And if that is so, if that is so, and we find ourselves in a situation where we don't have the money to subsidize it, isn't it logical that the government will have to reduce that subsidy? It's the same thing with gate. I was in the cabinet when we took a decision that we will put things in place 
to make sure that anybody who wants to study should not be denied the opportunity to elevate themselves through good study by an inability to pay. So we put gate in place. In those days, we had a very strong revenue stream. Gas was $13 a unit. Oil was $60 or $70 a barrel. So we had the money and we created gate and we funded it. When we came into office, things were quite different. And by that time, we had seen some significant abuse in the gate program. So what did we do? We put some experts to look at it, give us a report and some recommendations. One of the recommendations which we accepted was to restrict the use to certain conditions, fund certain people fully. Those who need all of the support will get all of it. Those who had better and stronger means and could contribute to their education will get a part of it. And now we've come to the point where we say, if you're earning upwards of some significant sum of money, you get none of it. What is wrong with that? In a situation where we don't have the funds to continue spending it the way we used to spend it. And you know what? All of a sudden, the same program that we initiated, same program, they now want to take it over and say, they are the big defenders of gate. Remember dollar for dollar? Dollar for dollar was their idea, you know. You have to have a dollar to get a government dollar. So those at the base of the pyramid that had no dollar got no, no tertiary education. Today they are the big mouthpiece for gate. The biggest defender of gate and the University of Trinidad and Tobago, both of which were created in recent times by the PNM, the biggest defender is the People's National Movement. Don't nobody fool you with that. And of course, you see, we as a country, don't forget, you remember when we had a hurricane here a while ago, and our prime minister was Kamala Prasad Bisesa? The hurricane was, was Jamaica. Jamaica is our biggest market in CARICOM. And she went up there, not the hurricane, she went up to Jamaica as prime minister. She went to Jamaica, and they raised with her a facility which a PNM government had put in place to help Jamaica with its economy so that Jamaica could continue being our biggest market. What did she tell the Jamaicans? She told them that Trinidad and Tobago is not an ATM. The government of Trinidad and Tobago wasn't an ATM for the Jamaicans who we need as our market. It was an ATM for she and Moonland and all of them, though. No, pro no problem with that. That ATM was no problem. And caused a serious rift between Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. And that was simmering under the surface. And the minute a handful of Jamaicans came to Piaco and were turned back, and that made news in Jamaica, the largest importer of Trinidad and Tobago goods into Jamaica started to organize a boycott of Trinidad and Tobago's product in Jamaica. I had to go to Jamaica and sit down around a table with 15 Jamaican ministers to pacify them and to tell them that that is not what Trinidad and Tobago is about and that we're brothers and we're sisters. Unfortunately for me, a large part of that government were colleagues of mine from the 70s I knew in Jamaica. So we get away. She told the St. Lucians when the hurricane came that if they want help, like Puerto Rico now, right? If they want help, you have to agree to buy products from us. That was Trinidad and Tobago foreign policy. But they have some imp from Naparima called Rodney Charles. He wants to know where Dennis Moses is. Dennis Moses is probably the most effective foreign minister this country has had for a very long time. Because he's not in it to show, he's in it to work. And he's working tirelessly. Last week, or is it the week before, we are here preparing the budget. And our budget time coincides with the UN General Assembly. You know that? September is when the UN meets in New York. That's our budget preparation time. I have never left here and gone to the UN. One of our prime ministers from this country, the one of recent vintage, went to the UN and talked to empty chairs, you know. Cost you over a million dollars. 
to go to the UN and talk to nobody. I have focused on the three budgetary periods to be here with the Minister of Finance, working on stabilizing the economy, and this year in planning to get some growth going forward. Next thing I know, they're making big noise about the, they can't, they don't know, they can't see the Minister of Foreign Affairs. You know why? Because Trinidad and Tobago was represented by the Minister of Foreign Affairs in New York. He was our representative there. I travel when I think it can benefit the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And she has the gall to come to the parliament, she and her imps, to be asking about how much travel I do. Let me tell you something. As prime minister, in the first two years, I have traveled, I think, on seven occasions. Seven times. And on every occasion, it's on important matters that require the attention and presence of the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. You know, Questions coming to me from them. You know how many times she traveled in the first two year period? 14 times. And of course, the cost of my first two years in prime ministerial travel is less than half of the cost of her first two years. One of her trips during that two year period was to go to New York to celebrate Indian, Indian National Day. What does the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago have to be going to New York to do that for? And of course, when she traveled, as you heard tonight, traveled with a, a shebang, a whole ching band, juve morning. Sister, brother, uncle. And you know, in the budget speech today, she made reference to a minister of government and a group of public officials going to Tobago and spending in Tobago $92,000. I chided the minister for that because I thought they could have avoided much of that expenditure. I chided the minister for that. But it was $92,000 by a ministerial delegation from Trinidad to Tobago. And of course, the other big point is that the minister of tourism went to Bahamas, didn't know to put her phone or take it off roaming and drew down accidentally some charges of $53,000. They want the Minister of Sport fired for that. They want the Minister of Tourism fired for that. But when Barry Padarat put in a bill for $90,000 while not being a Minister of Government, while his only function was to carry her briefcase and her shawl, they had nothing to say about that. But you have the press behaving as though they could measure the government by some Shamfakoje hotel um, telephone bill of fifty thousand dollars. I could tell you tonight, those two infractions are minuscule when put up against the savings that we have made across the board, across the country, as the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So I want to tell you tonight, we are a serious government. You have a serious government in office, and when we offer assistance to CARICOM citizens who have been devastated like no others have been, and you get up and disgrace us by trying to make an issue of the fact that we have held out a hand of friendship to our CARICOM colleagues, we say we stand by our country's principle, and Dominica, you're welcome. In the budget response today, one of the big points was that when they were in government, they were contributing a part of their salary to the Children's Life Fund. That might be so. But my grandfather always taught me that a cow that give a pail of milk and kick it down is of no use to the farmer. Put part of your salary in the children's life fund and turn around and thief it. Big investigation about monies leaving the children. I mean, under her regime, they were stealing money from dying children. And coming in the budget debate today to raise that about children's life fund. And then coming down with a list of things, a list of things that they did. One thing she never mentioned today was life sport. 
She missed everything she mentioned. She didn't mention live sport because they want you to forget live sport. You remember live sport? You remember Larry Hawaii? And Kamala Prasad Bisesa? They approved eight million dollars for something called live sport. They end up spending four hundred million dollars. And the end result is they created criminal conduct in this country where people were murdered left, right, and center. And today we are trying to overcome that. But she was very careful today in her record, not to mention live sport. But we and you will never forget that. Never forget that. I, as your prime minister, I will work tirelessly for you because I signed up for this job. And I signed up to do during this term of office what has to be done in your interest. It's a different time. It's a difficult time. Maybe if I was in office, if we were in office, at a time when you had oil price much higher and gas price much higher, we could have been far more generous. But tonight, what we have done is the best that can be reasonably done in a very difficult situation and is your best chance you have of coming out of it as quickly as we can. As quickly as we can. And of course, if we postpone these difficult things, we only prolong the hardship and we only worsen the outcome. Tonight, I want you all to see yourselves as being in the hospital and the doctor diagnose you and you have to have an injection. The injection engenders a certain amount of pain, but it also carries with it the potential for a healing. And the one thing that you have going for you now is that what little you have available will not be stolen or wantonly distributed by the government that you have elected. And on that score alone, on that score alone, you are ahead of the game. I could come here tonight, as she had done. I will give you this, I will give you that. I will give you this, I will give you that. How many, how many, how many parents you know? Come on, be honest. How many parents you know raising a child? And of course, the child, everything the child wants. Give you this, give you that, give you. And the one thing the child never got is training. Totally unmannerly, totally wasteful, and has no value system whatsoever. Huh? And as I'm advised by Mr. Hines, they could grow up to be in conflict with the law. A country is similar. We need to have some attitudinal changes. We need to have personal responses to public policy. And a lot of your personal responsibilities were being carried by the government of Trinidad and Tobago when the government was able to do it. Now you're hearing, as I speak to you now, the Minister of Finance is struggling to pay public servants pay at the end of the month. This is not Nancy's story. You know what they said in the parliament today? You know what the opposition said today? Eh? She said, no, she does not believe it, that there is money in the country. What she didn't say when she said that is that if she knows that she had left something, that are going with that too. Uh, uh. But I raise this with you. So you cannot look to them for any responsible position, any responsible action. They are all about playing the fool and hoping not to be noticed. And of course, they're hoping that we get nothing done. That's why they will agree to nothing. So that when the election time comes around, they will turn around and say, you didn't do anything during your term. Not on your nelly. We will do what has to be done. As I speak to you now, we put a new board into Petrochrin with instructions to fix Petrochrin, win, lose, or draw. How many of you, how many of you monitor your light switching the night when you're home? How many of you? Every house is wired with switches to turn off lights. You don't turn off lights in this country because the light bill is affordable. 
affordable light bill. I'm asking you, use the light switch and only keep your light on in the room when you're in it. That's how you cut back. You may cut back on a trip here and there. And if you want to help out, begin to eat local food, local produce, and share with your neighbor and train your children that what we have local is better than what we import. These are the things that you could do at the personal level. And all those who believe that public pressure and noise making will cause the government to turn away from the sensible prescriptions, I ask you to think again and join the opportunity, join the effort to face up to our circumstance. And if we do that, if we do that, the hope is that this period of difficulty will not be too prolonged. No amount of denial is going to change the fact that our circumstances have changed. You know what they're saying now? The, the government preaching gloom and gloom. And interestingly enough, the, the, the opposition leader ended her presentation today by demanding of the government that we bring back baby milk. And she had a brilliant suggestion, the most brilliant and singular and not even original position in the budget debate today is that those of you young girls who are making children and don't know what to do with them, get a bell and go by somebody's door. Get a box, put the child in a box. Ring the bell and bolt. Yeah, yeah. Something she learned that happening in Africa. That was the big point of the opposition leader today to deal with our circumstance. Yeah. I have never heard any more foolishness than that as advice to the young girls in Trinidad and Tobago. Go by somebody who well off and put his child in a box and ring the bell and run. So when the person hear the bell, they will come out and they will see a child and then they will intervene and take the child. So I tell you, those are their, those are their prescriptions. All of, all of that type, all of them, it doesn't take much to criticize. You see what the PNM is doing, you can criticize it, but question, what would you have done under the circumstance? Not an advice, not an idea, not a prescription. You know why? Because nothing that they have available to them can match what the PNM has made available to you. So tonight, I want to say to my people in Trinidad and Tobago, Whatever your location in this country, whatever your race, your color, your creed, or your class, Trinidad and Tobago is in this, and we all in this together, and we'll come out of it together. So back to the parliament tomorrow, and we'll hear the rest of them, and all of them will be critical of the government. They don't have a single recommendation to make. That is worthy of consideration. Let them prove us wrong tomorrow. So Trinidad and Tobago, on Monday, thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for listening. Let's stay the course and let's hold on to our nation with boundless faith in our destiny.